and to follow along because you never know. The Lord might inspire you with another passage that's, or some context to it. We should be good Bereans and look into everything that's being spoken, yes or no? Yeah. So we've been talking a lot about uh, church growth, and we've been dealing with our, ro- our roles as workers, and how many of us are supposed to be workers in God's vineyard? All of us. And so the roles of leadership then would be to uh, assist you as you guys are praying and seeking and receiving visions from God as far as what you should be doing and how you should be doing it. We should be helping to collect you and get you with others that have similar visions and, and give you what you need in order to be successful in your work. And so that is kind of the goal and the idea. But all this takes something called courage. And I want us to look a little bit deeper into this courage that we can have in Christ. So let's begin with the word of prayer. Father in heaven, we're thankful to be here today in your house. We're thankful that we can be here together. And we just pray, Father, that your spirit would touch our hearts and our minds, that you'd open us up to the revelation that you would have for us. And I pray, Lord, that we would leave this place better prepared as a result thereof. In Jesus' name, amen. So as was just so beautifully read in Psalm 31, 24, it tells us to be of what kind of courage? What was that? Good courage. So that must mean there's a bad kind of courage. Yes or no? We need to be of good courage, and the kind of courage that is being referred to here in the scriptures is not the kind of courage that we often see as acts of heroism and acts of death-defying displays of courage. That's not what it's talking about here. In fact, I want you to see as we continue through what kind of courage, and it's a courage that each and every one of you can possess. It says, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your what? Your heart. Is it at times that our heart needs to be strengthened, that sometimes we feel maybe we're just getting a little bit beat up or whatever the case may be? We need to be strengthened. So God says, be of good courage. And what will God do if we're of good courage? He's going to strengthen our heart, all you who do what in the Lord? We need to have our hope in the Lord. I love Joshua 1.9. Have I not commanded you? Be of strong, or be strong and of what kind of courage again? Good courage. Do not be afraid nor dismayed, for the Lord is with you wherever you go. That reminds me of a saying that Jesus made before he went to the kingdom of heaven, where he said, All power, all authority has been given unto me. Go ye therefore into all the world, right? To all nations, teaching them and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And then continuing to teach them. And then he says, and lo, I am with you how often? I'm with you always. And so courage is essential for every Christian. Every one of us. I believe that courage in this sense is a sense of strength that comes from a confident hope in God. It's a spirit and life and it's got this joy that it produces within us because we know that good things, we're confident that good things are yet ahead. It's a contentment, an excitement, a zeal for God. When the, the Bible tells us to be of good courage, it's telling us to keep our heads up, to stay strong because the best is yet to come. I like this quote by uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. It was high counsel that I once heard given to a young person, and this is what he said. Always do what you're afraid to do. Is it not that fear sometimes keeps us from doing the things that we would like to do? What if we always did what we were afraid to do as long as it was what God was asking, let's clarify it with that. How do you think the church would be? Let me tell you something. When we, 
as individual church members have that kind of courage and positive strength, all the powers of hell cannot stop us. The meetings of our church would be full of life and wonderful testimonies and experiences from the Lord. The discussions would be full of interesting revelations and exciting promises that we would uncover together in our study of the Word of God. The obstacles to working for souls, we would see them come down like the walls of Jericho. The church would be a place filled with hope, would it not? If we would simply always do the things that we are afraid to do. Notice this statement. As the Lord's people show their determination to follow the light that the Lord has given, the enemy will bring what? All his powers to do what? To discourage them. So then would it not be also true when that kind of good courage is lacking that the opposite would take place? That there would be doubt and weariness and disappointment? That there would be discouragement? That it would appear at times that the meetings were stale and on their last legs. That there would be discouragement spreading amongst our ranks. You know, you might be saying, it's no use praying for my stubborn loved ones. They're not going to they're not going to change anyways. It's no use resisting this or that temptation. I've tried it and I just can't get any victory. It's no use going to the meetings. I've already heard it all before and it doesn't work anyways. It's no use planning for evangelism. You see, these expressions of no courage are just full of doubt and surrender. We know who the enemy is, and we know what his work is, do we not? So are we just going to give in? After all, you say, I've tried, and it just doesn't work. I simply am too tired. I was the one, after all, that did it last time. And guess what takes the throne? Self takes the throne. We become discouraged and disheartened. Is it any wonder then that Satan would put all his energy towards stealing away our courage and making our situations appear hopeless? I mean, it seems that that's a good use of his time. What would you say? Great changes are soon to take place in the world. Do you believe that? Everyone will need an experimental knowledge of the things of God. What do you think that means, an experimental knowledge? What's that? Yeah. You've experienced it. It's not just something you know, but it's something that you've actually experienced. Yes or no? Yeah. We all need that. It is the work of Satan to do what? What is his work? To dishearten the people of God and to unsettle their faith. So our work should be to encourage the people of God and to settle their faith. Right? Aren't we at war with them? So you know what his work is, so then what should our work be? The exact opposite. I am sure Satan with his hellish agencies is striving his best to dishearten and discourage. But we must not be discouraged. Neither must we fail. Let us turn our eyes from everything that would dishearten and discourage. Satan will seek to distort everything in our vision and make a mountain out of a molehill. Our eyes must be fixed on Jesus. Notice with me Numbers 32, 1 and 2. 
Now the children of Reuben and the children of Gad, they had a very great multitude of livestock. And when they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, that indeed the region was a place that was good for livestock, the children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and they spoke to Moses to Eliezer the priest and to the leaders of the congregation. And notice what they said. Ataroth, Dibon, Jazer, Nimrah, Heshbon, Eliel, Shebam, Nebo, and Beon, the, count, the country which the Lord defeated before the congregation of Israel is a land for livestock. And your servants have livestock. Therefore they said, if we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants as a possession. Do not take us over the, to the Jordan. And Moses said to the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben, Shall your brethren go to war while you do what? While you sit here. You see, the devil knows just how easily we can become discouraged when brethren don't go with us. Isn't it true? How many of you have ever been discouraged because those in your family rejected your efforts when you tried to share the truth with them? Maybe it was a family member, maybe it was a brother, or sister, or maybe your own child. You became discouraged because they didn't go to work with you. They left you to go to do it alone. Have you ever had that happen? You decided you, you were going to go do work within the church and you found you were the only one working? Or how many of you have got involved in some ministry or activity in the church and you called, you planned, you put your whole heart into it? But it bombed. Nobody came or nobody showed you any appreciation or seemed to even notice. And in the silence that your brethren left you in. Somebody who had been silent during the whole excitement of the planning and preparation began to chatter in your mind like never before. Who is it? That's right, it's the devil. Remember, the devil's plan is to do what? To discourage you. And he does that by seeking and destroying. That's right. So you need to be ready. Yes or no? You know what his work is, so shouldn't we be ready for it? Shouldn't we expect that it's going to come? So how about doing this instead? Following Jesus' advice and saying, Get thee behind me, Satan. How about we don't start feeling sorry for ourselves? How about we don't throw up our hands in defeat and just take disappointment to the Lord Jesus Christ and let him offer us the balm of, Biliad, of Gilead to restore our courage? Could we do that? After all, it's not your fault. The Lord will teach you and he will be with you. Verse 7 says, Now why will you discourage the heart of the children of Israel from going over into the land which the Lord has given them? Is it possible that we sometimes help the devil in discouraging each other from doing the work that God's called them to do? Look at Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 3. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail, nor be what? nor be discouraged. Till what? Is there justice in the earth? Until that time, you can expect that God will not fail you, and he will not be discouraged. And the coastland shall wait for his what? For his law. 
Notice this in Isaiah 56 through 7. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who plucked out my beard. I did not hide my face from the shame and spitting, for the Lord God will help me. Therefore I will not be disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. So yes, the devil will do his best to discourage At times you will feel as though you are working alone. At times you will not see the the effects of the labor that you have so much poured your heart and soul into. But I want to remind you of one. One who was struck. One whose cheeks was smacked and hit and ridiculed. One whose beard was plucked out. One who hung on the cross and all those that were close to him had run away from him. All those that he had ministered to and given his heart to, they did not stand by his side. Those that he had healed, those that he had given sight to, they were nowhere around. He was seemingly left alone. And in this act of his greatest accomplishment, at the time it appeared to be his greatest defeat. And so what if we're looking at it all together wrong? What if we're seeking to only feel courage when things go well? When the people are chanting? When the people are participating? What if that was our definition of courage? I think then we'd be serving Barabbas and not Christ. I think then we might find ourselves at the judgment seat of God one day and wondering why he says, depart from me, I don't know who you are. And we'll say, but God, we came to church every Sabbath, we paid our tithes, we we, we were waiting for you to, to give us instruction to do, we were waiting for the right leadership to come in to motivate us, we were waiting, God. And he says, you haven't kept a single Sabbath. For six days shalt thou labor. And you thought I was talking about secular work, but I was talking about laboring on your knees for souls. Six days you should be going out and making the phone calls and encouraging your brethren. What were you doing? You thought you were keeping the Sabbath. You haven't kept a single one. Have you not read that when I created the world, I worked for six days in service to others? so that I could experience a Sabbath rest. That day of rest has nothing to do with the cessation of doing no work and resting on our mattresses. It's a day in which it is lawful to do good, but it's a day in which we reflect back on what we have done through the power and grace of God for others. It takes courage to follow after our Master Because he showed us the way. He said that there in those dark hours, in those moments of apparent defeat, that is where he is. I think sometimes we measure evangelism and the things that we don't want to do altogether wrong. For we look at it through the eyes of man. But if we saw it through faith and we understood really what it was all about, we would recognize that the very effort of doing the work and being a part of that work is, 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 is the victory in itself. You see, I believe some of the meetings that we'll think were more successful, when we look at it through the books in heaven, we will find that all we had done was made proselytes and baptized members for hell and made them just as bad and stubborn and stiff-necked as we ourselves are. I speak of myself. And I will find, I believe in the books, that in some of the meetings that we were discouraged and we thought that they didn't do anything, but yet they saved our own family and our own household. And like Noah of old, we preached our hearts out. We, we filtered and we did and we gave and we gave and we, we did all we could, but we were there. And if you think for one moment that you've heard it all and that you don't need it anymore, 
then all you are proclaiming is, is that the message of Laodicea is true. That we are wise and, and that we are in need of nothing and that we've got it all together. But if I, if I think for just a moment, the very messages, there's not one time I've preached an evangelistic series where it didn't speak something new to my soul. Where it didn't redirect my attention that I was wasting time and that I was, I was off track and it redirected my focus back to the things that matter, the eternal things. That it redirected me to that I should be serving and I should be giving my life. It, it reaffirmed my faith and the things that I was there for, it caused me to revive. And if we don't need that, then let's not do it anymore. But I believe, you know what courage is? Courage says, I don't wait for someone to ask me. I come because God has asked me. And I say, you know what I hear? You guys are are having an evangelistic series. Where can I be in that process? Could I go and meet them as they pull in? Could I greet them as they come? Could I help with the announcements? I mean, we should be a place of activity and excitement where everyone is seeking a part. Is that not what the cross has taught us? Is that not what setting our face like flint really is? You see, if all we did was show joy and excitement when things went well, we would never reach any soul. But what ignites others is when they see that we're not, we're not moved by circumstance. We're not moved by the fact that others aren't participating, but we know that God is near. For the Bible says, He is near who justifies me, who will contend with me. Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near me. Surely the Lord God will do what for me? He will help me. Who is he who will condemn me? Indeed, they will all grow old like a garment. The moth will eat them up. You want to know the work that we've been called to do? It's told to us in Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. For isn't the Lord's work our work? Didn't he say, come and follow me? Pick up your cross? So here it is. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. So the only way we could preach good tidings is if we have good courage. Yes or no? And so with that good courage, we preach good news because we can say that even though these things are going through, and, and, and in, in any other case, we would have thrown up our arms and given up. Courage says, here I stand. And they want to hear that message. He sent us to heal the brokenhearted. Maybe that's sending a card. Maybe that's a phone call. To proclaim liberty to the captives. And the opening of the prison to those who are bound. I've been visiting a young man, 18 years old, facing several felonies in prison. And after several studies with him, he finally said to me, he says, you know what, I'm starting to, for the first time, experience some hope. There's people that need hope. They're bound. They can't go anywhere else. We could be praying for them. We could be sending things to them. We could be visiting them. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. There's a work that we've got for six days to be doing, don't we? You see, six days shalt thou labor. It says in the Bible that we shouldn't put our foot on the Sabbath. That means we shouldn't be, the Sabbath isn't a day that we do our own works, but it's a day that we have this experience with God where we can look back with God and we can say, ah, it was very good. It was very good, God, because as I ministered to them, it ministered to me. And Lord, you were with me in those dark hours. And I was able to share how you're with them in those dark hours because of the experimental knowledge that I've gained from your word. Because I've learned that Jesus is especially close to us when we're battling discouragement. It 
says in verse 3, to console those who mourn in Zion. There are people who are hurting. They need our comfort, don't they? To give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness at the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. You see, my friends, when we labor for the least of these, his brethren, we labor for Christ. We serve him when we serve others. And so that's why he tells those that didn't work, I don't know who you are. Because how can he know if he's already told you how you can get to know who he is? He's the one that's crying. He's the one that's bound in prison. He's the one that lost someone. He's the one that's struggling with cancer. He's the one that wasn't dressed the way that you thought they should have been dressed. He's the one that did the things that you thought shouldn't have been done. And he says, you can show me how much you love me. You can show me the meaning of the cross by how you serve these people. Do you give them hope? And I don't know why my computer keeps shutting off, but there's a devil that wants to discourage me. But I'm not too worried about it. It says in Numbers 32, verse 9, For when they went up to the valley of Eskel and saw the land, they did what? They discouraged the heart of the children of Israel so that they did not go into the land which the Lord had given them. Is it possible that the Lord has given us things like faith, like courage, like joy and hope, but we refuse to go into the land that God has given because there was troubles, there was, there was trials, there was difficulties, and we could see them? Where can we go up, they said. Our brethren have discouraged our hearts. They've told us that the people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and the fortified up to the heavens. Moreover, we have seen the sons of Anakin there. You see, another way the devil seeks to discourage us is by magnifying the obstacles. You're too enslaved in your bad habits to live the Christian life. Give it up. Or... She's too stubborn to ever receive the truth, so I just won't bother praying for her. Or, oh, these people have everything that they need. It's no use witnessing to them. Let me tell you something. I think we as Christians have given way too much credit to the enemy of Jesus Christ. For what does Jesus say? Luke 18, 27, he says, the things which are impossible with men are what? Another way of saying that is, the things that are hard for men are easy for God. The obstacles that we see are not obstacles to God. When the devil succeeds in taking our courage, we become out of the loop as to the advancement of truth. And we begin to forget that we ever loved the truth. And one of the best things to inspire courage in the Christian is the affirmation of the truth that we have sacrificed everything for. When the religion of Christ is most held in contempt, when the law is most despised, we should throw up our hands and give up in defeat. Is that what it says? It's in those moments that we should experience the warmest fires of zeal and our courage and firmness the most unflinching. I mean, as we see cowardice and we see people that are just giving up, it should cause us to rise up as champions and to say, you know what? I'm going to meet that lack of courage with courage. I'm going to meet that lack of zeal with zeal. And though no one else is standing, here I am, Lord Jesus. Send me. 
You see, when we see that others aren't participating, we shouldn't go, oh, poor me. They're not participating. But it should encourage us to actually want to do more for our Lord. It should heat us up. It should give us a reason. I mean, as young people, we should be looking and saying, hey, if the, if the older people aren't going to do it, I'm going to do it. I'm not here to just sit and to receive a message week after week. I'm here to work. I'm here to see the kingdom of heaven come. It takes courage. It takes the mind of Christ. He didn't come here to serve or to be served. He came to serve, right? To give his life as a ransom. How about if we actually followed that advice? Wouldn't that make things different? What can I do to serve? How can I help? Do you think those words would be encouraging or discouraging to people who are trying to to come together and work. If, if you were, let's take Mike Potter, if Mike said to us, he came up before the front, he said, you know what, I need some people to go down to the prison with me. I got a group of people that, that really would be encouraged by you guys coming down there or, or, or coming in and raising up some awareness or doing something. And he, and he came up here and, and he heard people say, Mike, what can I do to help? Would that discourage you? I don't think so. Isn't that our work to encourage others? What if Taryn came up in the front and she said, hey, I'd, I'd like to gather together and, and go and, and, and do this witness project. And I know you all can't knock on doors, but if you could come and you could pray, if, if others could send a card, if, if you could just be here. Do you think just you showing up saying, how can I help Taryn? Do you think that would encourage her or discourage her? Because I can tell you she's called me before needing some encouragement because maybe it always doesn't happen that way. And I bet all of you have experienced that before. You poured your heart and soul into something. You were excited. You wanted to follow God. And you wanted to do something in the church, but nobody else seemed to get too excited about it. How does that make you feel? But could you imagine a church environment where guests would come in and they would see that we were so excited to serve that they would, it would, it would create this igniting uh, influence that they would be like, man, I want to go to that church and I want to work there, but it's hard if I don't get there quick, I'm not going to be able to do anything. Wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't it be awesome if we came already prepared with our Sabbath school lessons? We've, we've already spent six days working and we show up and we're there and we actually are testifying of how the lesson spoke to us instead of going through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. But we actually worked. We were there to serve. I don't know, that would be a pretty exciting place. At this time, we must gather warmth from the coldness of others, courage from their cowardice, and loyalty from their treason. The nation will be on the side of the great rebel leader, and we know that. We know what his work is, it's to discourage. We know what his attempts are, and it's simply to cause the church of Christ to sit in idleness, to meet from week to week, to bring up tithes, to send money to the conferences, to wait for pastors to come. The devil loves all of that, but he hates it when people actually look and become warm when others are cold. He hates it when people gain courage when others are cowarding away. He hates it when people are loyal when others are disloyal. He can't stand it when we take courage though we're on a cross-like experience in our life. He hates it when our face remains firm like Flint. And here's the root of it all in Exodus 20, 18 through 19. It says this, Now all the people witnessed the thundering, the lightning, the flashes, the sound of the trumpet, the mountain smoking, and the people saw it. They trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, Moses, um, you speak with us, and we will hear. 
but let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to do something to you. How many of you guys like tests? Nobody's jumping up saying, I want a test. You know why you don't like tests? Because you're not prepared for them. If you were prepared for a test, you wouldn't mind the test. Yes or no? You'd actually be looking forward to it. I can't wait for the test so I can show what work I have done. So I can sit there and be like, God, it was very good. But the reason we don't like tests is because we slack. At least that's why I didn't like tests. Put it off, put it off, then you're trying to cram it all in. But if I read my Bible correctly, it says that you can't cram it in. Character development is right now. You see, God is testing us to see how we're going to respond in the midst of cowardice. How are we going to respond in the midst of coldness? How are we going to respond when others are responding in a mean way? Or they're not supportive. Are we going to be like Flint and get people on fire? Because we're unmovable. God is looking for courage. God is looking for a courage not like the world. Some act of heroism. Some death-defying moment. But he's looking for a life of a Christian who has given themselves for service, who has said, here I am, Lord, in response to the cross. I will no longer judge my life by circumstances. I will no longer judge the experiences by the circumstances. I will no longer judge whether something is successful by the circumstances or by whether people like it or not. I will stand and let Christ be my judge. And he has said, work. And so here I am, God, to work. That is courage. And that is something that each of us need. But I want to tell you today the good news. It's a gift of God. And it's only gained through experience. And each of you receive a test, including myself. And now is the time to prepare to pass the test. Six days shall you labor on your knees. Six days shall you labor responding to the call at your work offering invitations of grace, offering opportunities for people to learn. Six days shall you labor to prepare yourselves for the Sabbath. It's not to be done on Friday. Six days. That way when the Sabbath comes, you can rest. And rest you will so that you can have energy for another six days of work until all is put under God's feet. Would you pray with me? Loving Father in heaven, I struggle to preach this sermon because I myself often am a coward. Lord, I am often directed by my feelings and the circumstances that are around me, but Lord, your word is truth. And your example, I cannot deny. For Lord, when others would have given up, you persevered. When others would have been put off by all the ridicule and and would have just said it's not worth it, you said we were worth it. Lord, when others would have not been able to take the pain. You took it and you spoke nothing in retaliation. And Lord, though you had all the power and all the strength to free yourself of the horrible darkness, Lord, we saw that you entered into that darkness and you brought light and hope. And so, Father, I pray that you would inspire upon our hearts that we wouldn't look around and and seek and, and try to find if others 
are responding to your call, but that, Lord, that we, each of us right here, right now, would take a moment before the God of gods and the King of kings and that we would say unto you, Lord, I don't know how. I don't know how I'm going to be courageous and have this good courage, but I know this. I know that you are with me and I know that that tomorrow is a better day because you are with me today. And I know, Lord, that even though it may appear darkness, I know that you are light and you are with me in that darkness. And so, Father, I pray, I pray that you would instill courage in the hearts from the very young to the very old. And Lord, that we wouldn't believe the lies that only 10% are here to work, that we wouldn't believe the lies of what all the reasons for discouragement and all the things that the father of lies tries to do, but that we would believe the truth. And the truth is, is that no circumstances and no obstacles can overcome our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so help us, Father, to be on your side and to fight the good fight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.